Okay. Today I'm going to do what I promised I would do the first week, that is to say, get to know you a little bit, hear from you who you are, your favorite film, etc. Then I'm going to review with you week two and week three and talk about the assignments because Friday is the first deadline for the first written assignment together with some readings. After that, I will use whatever time is left in today's lecture to continue the examination and the analysis of key moments in It Happened One Night with the help of a series of frames, screenshots that I took from the film, which you find under week two. In fact, under week two, I also added another link to a much larger PDF, almost 400 megabytes, where you find frames from the entire movie taken automatically at two seconds intervals so that if you want to review a certain moment, if you want to see the captions that are included to review certain lines, you can do that. And also, either from that PDF or directly from the screen of your digital device when you see the film, you can capture yourself a frame and include it in your viewing notes if you want because you think it would be easier and simpler to then add your comments about that frames, which is indicative either of a visual setup of the movie communicating something or representative of a particularly relevant moment in the story, in the development of a character, etc. Okay, so part one introductions. Tell me your first name. Tell me your plans for the future. Don't tell me your majors. Tell me, answer the most American of questions. How do you see yourself in five years? Okay? And it doesn't matter. You, you can shoot as high as the sky. Okay? Tell us about your dreams. Third part of your presentation, you can just say your favorite movie. I know it's a silly question. I don't have a favorite movie myself. I have the favorite movie of the last three months or of the last year. Anyway, answer as best you can. And besides the title of this film, if you want to summarize really quickly your favorite movie moment, a scene in that film that struck a chord with you, okay? Name, future professional plans, and favorite movie or and or favorite movie moments, and, and very boringly, we'll go row by row and person by person, but we'll last from the back, okay? Thank you. Go ahead. Second part of this class, let's review the website so that we are clear. It's the beginning of the semester. I'm not going to do this every time, but so that we're all on the same page, let's review what kind of material available for you or required, requiring your attention, you find on the class website. This is the page for week two, which is the current week, and the first section, which is the kind of template followed by the other pages, takes you to another page with notes about the film. For this week, I'm not going to use these notes, but you're free to, and, and this is not exactly a required reading, but it's strongly recommended. These notes are simple enough. You can have a look very quickly in just a few minutes. 
simply to reinforce what you heard in class. And whenever there are points in here, there are obscure cryptic or were not discussed in class, just skip over them. This is also where you find the PDF with all the frames from the film. As I said before, as you can see there on a Google Drive, a Google Drive account given to me by the university. So if you have logged in, even just simply into your university Gmail account, then you don't have to log in again to download this file. Of course, you have to download it to see it inside your browser or a PDF reader. Uh, it, it's not, the file is too big for a preview, okay? Go back to week two. This that you either see embedded as a widget where you can scroll and see all the PDF pages, or if you are connecting from a phone, you just see a link. This is a collection of about 200 frames that illustrate all the key moments in the development of the protagonists, Peter and Ellie, and this is what I used in class on Monday, and I'll use a little bit today as well. Of course, keep in mind that we meet for the lectures in here, Mondays and Wednesdays, but you have to watch the film during your own time. So for every film, you see where to find it. So you can uh, watch this on Amazon Prime, and otherwise you can click on this link which you will find for every single week and every single film to this very useful website justwatch.com where you will see everywhere else where you can find this film. Let's, let's have a look quickly. So you click in here, again you see where you can rent it, where you can buy it. And this is pretty much up to date with the exception of prices. Sometimes prices are not updated regularly. But as I said, the films we will watch in class cost $4.99 to rent or less. And if you want, you can buy them so that you can review them later on or have more time to look at them. Go back. Okay. Next, we're still under week two. We find a link to another page. I told you how Frank Capra's film It Happened One Night is based on a short novel. It was called That Way that appeared in Cosmopolitan in August 1933. And there you find some excerpts in this page from that. And it's not required, it's an optional reading, just to give you an idea. And at the end of this page, you also find a link to a PDF on my Google Drive account where the entire um, short story or novella is uh, included. Next, you find the first required reading. It's just a few pages from uh, a book, uh, from, from two books, actually. One is called In Capra's Shadow. The other is Journalism in the Movies, because Peter is a journalist, right? And a lot of films from the 1930s and 40s, but even nowadays, assigned this kind of profession to the main protagonist quite often. 1930s, 40s, especially inside comedies, the male protagonist is often a journalist or someone who works as a creative in advertising, right? So, because it gives more freedom, more appeal to the character, 
also provides the justification for the prospect of potential riches, the idea that you can turn the corner in your life just with one bright idea that you can sell a story or an ad and then you, you're done, right? Rather than show in a boring job where you have to work 10 years to get your first promotion. So here you find a series of PDFs with essays or articles on this film. And again, only reading number one is required. And this is the template. I'm illustrating this because this is pretty much the template for the other weeks and the other films. Again, I'm providing more in case you have a personal interest or you feel like you need to read more in order to do an assignment, especially when we'll come to the essays um, for a film. Next, of course, for every week, you find the YouTube videos of the lectures by the next day a YouTube video is posted in case you want to review a segment or in case you missed a class. Of course you find the assignments for next week and next week's movie is Detour so you find already where to see on Amazon and in this case currently it's free for Prime members. Of course these things can change without notice and otherwise you can check if it is available on another platform by using just watch for this film it happened one night from this week and the next week and the weeks after that the two weeks after that you have to post viewing notes inside your google docs file google docs file were created and shared Saturday morning last week. A notification should have reached you. If you haven't found it, reach out to me. Or if you've lost the link to your file, just let me know. All of the assignments go inside that Google Docs file. And the Google Docs file, when you open it, contains a section with instructions. Simple enough instructions. Things such as the latest assignment goes on top. You can resolve comments about specific passages of your assignment, but don't delete the comment with the grade. Of course, the grades are transcribed by me. It's just a matter of practicality to see both you and I be able to see the progress you are making or otherwise. And as far as the viewing notes, always refer to the set of prompts that were posted under week one. And we can look at them right now. This is inside the page for week one. And you find the paragraph from the syllabus telling you what the goals are for the viewing notes. The primary goal is to show you've seen the movie and that you've paid attention to the film. But the second goal is to show that you are making progress with the understanding of the features, the qualities, the intellectual framework of a road movie. So the viewing notes are not just, I like this actress or I like the car they're using in this film. They're more educated comments. Although as the prompts specify, Viewing notes don't have to be a narrative, right? They don't have to be a formal assignment. They can be a series of comments. They can be a series of bullet points if you want to, okay? Separate comments. But those comments have to be informed by your learning through the class discussions, the presentations, and the readings. Uh, yes, uh, I'm trying to remember your name, Dan. Dan? Okay, Dan, thank you. Is there a word count? I'm sorry? Word count for the uh, video Yeah, a minimum of 300 words. Uh, I specify the maximum in the syllabus, 500. Just to give you an idea, the maximum is, is not a hard limit. The minimum is, and yet keep in mind that 
if you only write 300 words, you may not get an A unless those 300 words are incredibly brilliant comments, okay? Um, and besides this basic paragraph with a philosophy, you find a series of specific prompts. I call it the matrix so that I can refer to it quickly. Keep in mind that you have five categories in here, but they don't apply as strongly and significantly to all of the films, and you don't have to answer all of them in your comments. They're prompts, they're not questions. So don't go one, two, three, four, five when you write your viewing notes. Just keep in mind that for a film, it might be more important to spend time or on one and three or two and four than the other points. But, and, and this is just to give you a, a, an idea of what it means to write viewing notes that are relevant for the class and the topic of the class, okay? Rather than random notes. And let's review them quickly, although I did already introduce them, and you find a link that brings you exactly to the video <laughs> chapter, to the few minutes where I illustrated the matrix during the first lecture. So the first of these prompts is about destinations. So it's a, often a road movie is a road trip film, right? So there is a destination, there is a physical destination or a destination that is described in the initial plans by the end of the film, the characters might end up somewhere else, physically. I'm still talking about a physical destination. However, uh, there could be a clear symbolic destination, right? Meaning, what is the symbolic uh, significant meaning of the trip? I mentioned last week, uh, Bones and All by uh, Guadagnino, which is not one of the film we uh, introduced. Uh, we, we were going to talk in this class, but in there, the physical destination based on the initial plans is for the female protagonist to find her mother. And of course, the symbolic significance of that is quite clear. She grew up without a mother. The mother is also an eater as she is, so she's also different, so she wants to find out what it means to be an eater and what her life will be or how she should confront her identity as an eater, right? And again, don't take this too literally. In some films, the symbolic destination may not be as strongly visible or even relevant as in others. During the journey, there are transformations that take place. So what are, how are the characters changing psychologically, emotionally, or spiritually? And how is their identity different? Not just the fact that they've gone through this experience, but by the end of the film, how are they a different person? or a person who is aware of their identity, of their core identity, in a uh, deeper sense. C is very important for the understanding of a road movie, because C is what might be uh, underestimated, overlooked by a casual viewer role play, or as I call it here, impersonation. During the trip, during the journey, since the road, being on the road is being inhabiting a space that is quite different, where different rules may apply, oftentimes characters do some role playing, pretend to be someone, and we see that very strongly in It Happened One Night. So, Initially, both characters are pretending to be uh, hiding their identity, right? One is, Peter is hiding the fact that he's a journalist. She's hiding the fact that she's the daughter of a millionaire and that she's being, ser 
look, uh, uh, she, she, she's being pursued by the detectives, sent out by her rich father. Later on, they do a lot of role playing, pretending to be husband and wife on the road, because otherwise they couldn't share a room, be seen together in public by the moral standards of the time. And of course, by the end, they want to be first, she wants to be with him long term. Then he decides that, and, and there is the, the typical misunderstanding that separates them so that you can have a final act where they come together again. The road itself is significant. By the road, I mean all the external circumstances of the journey outside of the characters who act on them. People they encounter, obstacles, problems on the road, things they didn't expect and that end up changing them in one way or the other. And again, this can be more significant, more important for some films than others. And keep in mind, the second part of this, what kind of space is the road? That is to say, it's a social space that is not so strongly codified. And at the very least, even if when there might be rules, even on the road, you're outside of your familiar environment. No one knows who you are because you're far away from home. So it's easier to pass or for, for something that you're not, somebody that you're not or uh, to act differently, okay? So there are rules that could be applied by the characters, introduced or created by the characters, or completely subverted by the characters. And the final part of the matrix is what are the visual elements? This is still a film. It is not a story, it's not a play, it's not a literary novel or short story. Although by now, if you, if you read books, most novels coming out are practically like the film, right? They don't have the uh, structure, the breadth of 19th century novels. They're practically already a short film uh, or, or a long film. So how is the story being told by the visual element, by what is called technically the mise-en-scene, and you can click in here, and it's a very simple article, easy to follow, easy to understand, but basically what are the props, what are the objects you place in each frame? How do you place the characters on the frame? How they hold their position, how they use their body, how are they dressed, etc. So all the elements that are not expressed directly through the lines, through the actions, but that build up a certain kind of atmosphere or uh, create a series of themes for the film. By theme, I mean something that uh, emerges from a variety of scenes that is laid out across a series of sequences in the film, right? So the visual is also the poetic part of the film. That's why I added the second part. What else is the film about, right? Because the film may be telling a story, but at the same time, there is a certain vibe, music to it that resonate emotionally or intellectually with the viewers. It could be the landscape, right? It could be the silences. It could be the holes or the gaps in the story, things that are never explained, but that stay with you and do something in your mind. I added a series of practical recommendations. The best way would be to watch a film twice. The first time you just see the movie, you don't worry about the class, the assignment, and you go with it and react with it. Please, please don't stop to check your phone every few minutes because otherwise the whole experience is completely ruined. And the second time you watch the movie, but you stop at 
some point and you say, okay, I want to write a comment about this. And that's why I suggested that if possible, you might also take a, a screenshot, a frame, and put it there uh, to, so that you don't have to describe every single thing to place your comment, right? Because a comment will have to be connected. If you comment on a scene, you'll have at the beginning of your comment to refer to that particular scene, right? Keep that in mind. So that is the matrix. And um, let me show you briefly week three, which I just completed. I'm just slowly transferring the material from my own personal server, andreafedi.com, into uh, this platform, okay? So this is next week's plan. The film is Detour. It's a film noir directed by Edgar Omer, and it came out in 1945. As usual, you find a page with notes and analysis. You find a section on where to find this film online. You find an optional reading with an interesting review by Roger Ebert, who was a great reviewer of the past. And you find a series of readings, including one from the textbook. One, two, and three are required. Four is optional, if you're curious, if you want to explore. Another optional reading, some pages from the novel, uh, 1939 novel, Detour, um, that is the basis for the film, and in fact, the author of the novel, Martin Goldsmith, collaborated on the screenplay, with the screenplay. And the protagonist of the film was an actor by the name of Tom Neal, his son, who looks exactly like him, was the protagonist of a 1992 terrible remake. It's almost shot by shot, uh, that kind of remake. It's not available online, although there is a very poor quality version on YouTube and talking about YouTube. Do use the links to find the film because, for example, if you put Detour on Amazon, you find 10 films uh, with that title and you don't want to watch uh, Detour from 2009 and write new notes on that and then I'll say, Zero, this is the wrong film, okay? But just that you know, that some of these films are classics and remakes can be made. Okay, so that was it for this part. Before I go back to resuming my presentation of frames and moments from It Happened One Night, do you have questions about the homework, especially about the first week of assignment? And keep in mind that one of the advantages of working on these shared Google Docs files is that you can start writing something and then put a comment saying, am I on the right tra track or can you help me with this? I'll receive a notification through the, from, from the server in my email and I will respond as soon as I can. If you uh, feel that you need more help with this, Keep in mind that you can schedule an appointment with me on Zoom, for example, uh, tomorrow uh, afternoon, although tomorrow I think I only have two or three slots uh, left at this point, but in the future also, keep in mind, if you need help, you can schedule uh, that appointment or come to my office and discuss the assignment if you have something or if you have questions or if you don't know where start okay and keep in mind that we will be doing this regularly for a series of films for um, eight of the films you will be providing viewing notes for three more films you will provide short essays in the form of a narrative with an introduction middle part a conclusion and then there is a final paper okay we'll talk about that any questions? Okay, good. And uh, OK. 
Okay, so we were talking about the moment in it happened one night when for the first time the two characters of Peter and Ellie spend the night together pretending to be husband and wife. And initially is out of necessity. That is to say, he has to register her with the owners of this uh, auto camp, of this road motel. But then we will see how they are forced to go deeper into this kind of role play. And that is typical of road movies. The idea that one way you change your identity is experimenting with alternative roles. Pretending to be somebody else is a way to venture out of your identity and to discover hidden desires or parts of you that were not expressed in your normal social environment, right? They're both out of their environment. She especially, because she's not shielded, protected by the servants. She's not in a yacht, in a villa, in a palace. And he is a journalist who's unemployed and on the road were facing uh, a, a critical moment. So what happens in terms of how the road impacts on them is that this situation imposes on, for example, in this case, the female protagonist, another test. Because there is no bathroom adjoined to her cabin, she has to go to the showers of the auto camp and be in line with all these women being watched in this idea, in her condition, and really without a fancy dress. She's just like every other woman. And this little scene is a manifestation of that. She asks the women, is this the place where you shower? Then she goes to the door, disregarding the fact that there is a line. And of course, she's sent back to the back of the line and scolded and made fun of. So for the first time, she experiences a normal situation where she's not treated as an upper class member of society without that kind of respect or without the kind of power that comes with her position, okay? And you see the reactions of the women, there are very strong reactions. These women, of course, are members of the populace. Then she has to confront Shapley once again. This is the man who came unto her on the bus until Peter came over and said, I want to sit next to my wife. And what is the significance of this part of the sequence? Again, she's forced to go deeper into her role playing. She has to say, whether she likes it or not, that she is the wife, right? At this point, she cannot deny that she has to get along with the initial pretense, with the initial lie or simulation. And this is what, in this kind of movie, eventually produces a change, a change that is deeper, right? And it's not just behavioral psychology. Change your behavior, your mind will change. It, it goes much farther, right? Even Aristotle, the famous Greek philosopher, was a behaviorist. He was convinced that you become whatever you do habitually, that eventually your habits change you at a deeper level. So she goes back to find a breakfast that is simple, limited, not the kind of breakfast the aristocracy would enjoy, or the daughter of a millionaire would be served, but you see, she's very happy. She's finding happiness in this kind of condition, and this is important because by the end of the film, even though she's the daughter of a millionaire, you don't see her on her honeymoon. At the end of the film, she's on the road again. We know they're both in Michigan, but where are they? Are they in a posh hotel? 
because now she can use her father's money and he can as well? No. They're living within their means. They're still driving the same car that he will steal later on from a thief, right? So there is a partial justification. And they are another road motel, very inexpensive, the kind of $2 place, $2 per night place that they're in now, right? So you see that this is the anticipation of a kind of social redemption. By the end of the film, she doesn't need the posh hotel, the servants, in order to be a happy wife. And neither does him, as, as the uh, son-in-law of a rich man. Okay, so she has this breakfast, and they, they talk about each other, right? Because keep in mind that he's been acting as a caring husband, but it's just a pretend game. And she knows that down deep, he doesn't respect her, that he still thinks that she's a spoiled brat. Okay, so that's why you have this kind of dialogue. And then as part of the game, and to show you that really, whenever he plays the role, the husband is acting in that role. It is playing with the trope of the husband rather than uh, enabling him to be a traditional husband, you have him teaching her how to dunk. And again, it's not stupid men mansplaining a silly thing to an allegedly stupid woman. No, it is really irony and comedy playing with these roles, right? So who wrote the script is very much aware of the silliness of this exchange. So it's like throwing away the traditional role of a husband, making fun of it. It is a mockery of the leading husband teaching uh, his wife about life, okay? It is, right? It's not like in 1934, teaching how to dunk a donut was considered husbandry. No, okay? Clearly not. And that's what I defined as a Seinfeldian moment, because this is the kind of comedy you find a lot in Seinfeld, where the most trivial activity will be made into a philosophy, with rules to follow, with a precise etiquette. And there we are, the same way that meeting with shapely from the bus forced Ellie to act as the wife and go deeper into her role playing will happen when two detectives come to the auto camp. They're sent by Ellie's father and they want to make sure that this young couple is not the people they were looking for. Okay, so they come into the cabin with, with a certain amount of arrogance. They know they're coming. They hear them. And so they prepare for a theatrical performance. Look how he touches up her hair. And then he will instruct her to unbutton her dress, to uh, do something with her skirt also. So it is like acting, makeup, dress, and then the script. And the script is, in order to pass as a couple, they have to argue in a realistic, convincing way. And this, of course, it's role-playing, but will bring them together. They'll be able to con uh, the uh, detectives, to convince the detectives that they're an actual couple. But by the end of this, they experience a kind of joy or exhilaration that brings them together. And so initially, there are two parts to the dress game. Initially, he's preparing her for, for this lie, right? At the end, he will unbutton her himself, but this time, it's intimacy. 
it's not an exterior act, right? It's a natural, spontaneous act. So you see them coming closer and closer together, and I, I, I will not go over the various lines, and it's a, it's a nice scene, and, and this is where they are naturally together. She's not worried about what he's doing. For example, she's not trying to stop him and say, well, I'll do it myself. What are you doing? Don't touch me. No, it feels natural. They've played this part at this point, the part of the couple at this point. It feels natural to them to have these small intimate gestures, such as, let me help you. And notice they'll, they have a line. Uh, we'll call this one the great deception, which is a a play of words with the Great Depression, right? This film was shot not long after uh, the Great Depression. It hit the United States, and the United States had not fully recovered. But what is more important, besides the humor in the choice of words, is that this great deception is we are in love. But is it deception? We are a couple. Is it deception? until when in the movie. So is it something they play to deceive others, or is it something they play to hide what they're starting to feel for each other? OK, keep that in mind. And I'll continue for just a few minutes. Incidentally, the watch over there is one minute ahead. So at this point, we see as it is common in films from this era, a lot of films use this prop to advance the story, to show newspaper articles. So we know that she's being uh, pursued by the detectives, that there is a reward that is being offered. Her picture is everywhere. And keep in mind, they spent $2 for the night at the cabin, so imagine what how much it was, $10,000 uh, during that period, right? 100000 or 200000 of today's dollars. So they resume the trip. Remember that the bus had stopped because there was a problem with a bridge that was washed out by a flood. So Shakely has seen the newspaper, has recognized her, and Shapley wants to make money off of this. Right? He understands that it's all a ruse, that they're not a couple. However, before he can act on this, we see this curious scene by today's standards. A lot of films from the period included a song or more or some kind of theatrical interlude. In this case, on the bus, you find three musicians and they're singing a song about the young man on a trapeze, uh, about a circus man uh, uh, who uh, makes women fall in love with him. And the entire bus is singing. And in fact, after the first stanza, there are two passengers who separately continue with the song, introduce additional stanzas. So this, of course, is in part what people expected when they went to a film. They expected also to have these musical interludes that were only loosely connected with the story. Two, however, the second thing about this is that it shows that they're in sync with society. That not only are they playing the part of couple, but they're successfully integrated with the people around them. At the beginning of the film, they're separate. They're in the back, in their own bench. They don't really interact much. Now they're becoming part of society. And this is part of the dynamic of the theme of being a couple for the second part of the film. A couple is something that is integrated in society, but only partially. And later on, he will tell her during another night, uh, they spent together with the same blanket, dividing them, talking from opposite sides of the blanket. He will tell her 
about his dream, his romantic dream is to take a woman, take it, bring her to ha an island with starry skies and, and to live a wonderful uh, life there. But this island is not some kind of crazy romantic dream. This island is clearly a symbol, it's a metaphor. What is in fact the island? The island is the couple. The island is the idea that a couple lives separate from the rest of society. In order to be successful, they have to be part of a world inhabited only by them. But then this island is not completely separate from the rest of the world. And so they're also connected. But they have to form this bond. They have to separate from the world before they can successfully enter the world and be in the world.